This is a relay project. The discourse starts right now with Cheryl Oates and Erica Baroudis. Well, welcome to the very first episode of The Discourse. Yes, our first episode of our brand new podcast. We are so happy that everybody who's listening is here today. Um, Maybe we'll just start with a little bit on what to expect from the podcast. Today, we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to tell you what you can expect over the first initial six weeks of this podcast launch. And uh, maybe I'll start with a little bit of background on myself before throwing it over to Erica. So like I said, I'm Cheryl Oates. I'm based in Calgary. I'm Alberta born and raised, and I started my career in journalism, where I spent nearly a decade before making the jump to politics and joining the NDP in a feisty four-seat opposition party as the fourth party in Alberta politics, um, call it right place, right time, as I worked through the historic 2015 election and uh, served as Rachel Notley's communications director for her entire term as Premier of Alberta. And now, although I will say I have officially left political staffing life, I can't seem to pull myself away from any NDP campaign in Western Canada. And I spend my days um, doing offering political advice to companies and organizations looking to talk to government. Over to you, Erica. Well, Cheryl, we always say that we don't agree on much, but uh, I think that the we can't get away from politics is something we both share. Um, I'm a Saskatchewanian, moved to Alberta in the early 2000s. My aunt was very involved with uh, the PC party at the time, and that's kind of how I, I got my feet wet in politics. Uh, my first big stint was uh, working for Gary Marr during his 2011 leadership. Did some stuff before, but that was when I really think I got the political bug. <clears throat> moved up to Edmonton, where I live now, um, working at the legislature. I worked under Allison Redford, um, and then I took a little bit of a break, still a little bit involved. I was the founding president of the United Conservative Party under Jason Kenney, and uh, came back to for my second stint, but short stint, to say it was I was there for a good time, not a long time, uh, under <laughs> Danielle Smith as her principal secretary, where I left to go um, help with the election campaign that seemed to turn out pretty well for me. As we launched this podcast, I got so many messages being like, how did this happen? You and Erica, an unlikely combination. Um, but I think for us, it's not that unlikely. So we ended up being the spokespeople for our respective parties through the 2023 Alberta campaign. And that meant we were head to head on uh, national TV, on national radio, online, um, sharing our party's ideas, sharing our party's talking points and sort of like holding each other accountable and arguing over, you know, who was right or who had the best ideas. And I think what we found through that is that Erica and I have this ability to completely and absolutely disagree on so many political positions, but also continue to respect each other as we have that discourse and dialogue. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing as, you know, we were talking about it kind of over stampede, seeing what people thought, and then, you know, kind of just, it kind of just came together. Um, And, you know, thanks to sitting down with Ryan Jesperson and Real Talk really brought this all together. Um, And I always think about like, why behind the podcast? There's a lot of political podcasts out there. There's a lot of places where you can find information about Alberta politics. But the thing for me is I always think about the people I know and hang out with, and most of them aren't conservative, just a disclosure. Shocking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, live in Edmonton. Um, but uh, is those busy people that, you know, there's so much information out there. You can usually find, you know, what's aligning with you. What we really wanted to do, and I think you agree, Cheryl, is like, let's let's bring our ideas together. Let's have constructive dialogue. And I'm not here to convince people to necessarily like, you know, bleed a UCP. And I think you're the same. We want to get the spin and rhetoric out of it and really just come with a place where people can listen to two sides of the story and come up with their own opinion. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think hopefully this is an opportunity to have real discussions about the issues that should matter most to people in Alberta. It has become so, so difficult to have these conversations as politics has become more divisive. I cannot imagine my friends who are on opposing political teams, like sitting down and having a beer and really hashing out the issues. So like Erica said, we hope that those people listening are able to hear us sort of share our ideas, 
respect one another's ideas, maybe once in a while change each other's minds and come away after listening to our show um, with a really fulsome understanding of the issues that are facing Albertans, armed with the facts and the information that allows you, the listener, to make up your mind for yourself, knowing that you, you know, we're both coming from biased positions, but that you've sort of heard the whole side of the story. This podcast wouldn't be even possible unless we had incredible people backing us. Uh, I want to just talk about one of our, our first uh, sponsors, and that's California Closets, which my OCD side just loves everything about them because I'm like, there's a place for everything. Um, but they're not actually just closets. They have immaculate designs they offer their clients. Uh, and that ranges from office space, Murphy beds, entertainment centers, basically every room of your house can have a little California love. But Cheryl, I know you have your own little story about California closets. I do. My husband and I purchased a house in Calgary about a year ago this month. And when I had seen the house online, beautiful house, but I was not sold on the closet space. I have lots of clothes. I have lots of shoes. I want a place to put them all. And the pictures on the listing only showed one regular closet inside the master bedroom. But when I got to go see the house, there was this awesome walk-in California closet. And when I walked into that room, knowing it would be my personal walk-in California closet, I looked at my husband and said, we live here now. And I appreciate that closet every single day. What's happened between now and then when you and I were doing weekly panels talking about the, the election? So um, I'll, I'll go first because I won, you know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in the last time, like the... the Stampede is always a big thing for politicians. You see everyone at everything. Um, but then I think that the UCP did a good job of kind of more going to the, the grassroots style or the community style consultations and really a little bit quieter than uh, I think all of us uh, maybe thought we would get um, from both sides. I think the NDP did the same thing. Um, I've really seen uh, Premier Danielle Smith come into her role as Premier. She's really, you know, in her stride she's figured out the role and um even though there's a lot of new caucus members we're still seeing you know a, a strong united front from the governing party so I, i'm actually quite impressed uh even after this week of the legislative session that we'll get to in a little bit of just like how they've kind of come to the table um you know how she's been very consistent um which was uh, the opposite of a lot of people's criticisms of her yeah and i mean going back to that night um you know, without rehashing the entire campaign, which you can imagine I am not up to doing today, um, considering that we lost. I think, like, clearly the NDP felt like it had a path to victory. And I think it is so rare that on an election night, you go in seeing a path for both parties. Like, typically you go into an election night sort of knowing, even if you're not willing to say it out loud, what's going to happen. And that wasn't the case in this election campaign. I don't know if, how the UCP side felt, but the NDP watching the results come in slowly, 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 um, we're on the edge of our seats. And then when the advanced votes started to come in in communities that we are, were mu must win targets, we kind of knew it was over. And I think the NDP has taken the summer to reflect on what went well and what went wrong with that and what the party needs to do to continue to grow on the awesome momentum it has built. Because let's be fair about it, the NDP made incredible progress in the last election despite losing. Um, and it took some time to just kind of go quiet and lick its wounds a little bit and think about how to position itself over the course of the next four years. And I think we've seen this week that the party has come back with sort of a renewed energy, a renewed focus. And, you know, in hindsight, looking at all the progress that we've made, especially in Calgary, um, a renewed excitement about what's ahead. And, and what does that mean for your party? I mean, there's been lots of talks about Rachel Notley, what she's going to do. Um, you know, she's she's come out in the first week kind of like very strong and, and the party has like, you know, there being a, a strong official opposition. So, you know, I mean, there's lots of rumors all the time and there was expectations that she was going to leave, you know, before the session. That's not the case. So what does that look like? And how do you come into a legislative session um, as the leader, knowing that, you know, you've got kind of a, a clock ticking in the background? Yeah, I think like Rachel Notley has said publicly, you know, this is something she's going to think about, about what her future with the party looks like and whether that means staying on as leader through the next election or whether that means stepping aside and letting someone else take the position. Um, she hasn't made a decision on that yet. And I think it's fair 
um, you know, she's been the leader of the party for a decade now. She has done it so well. She has grown the party from four seats to a majority government to the largest opposition the province has ever seen. I think it's fair to let her take her time and really think about not only what's best for her and what's best for her family, but also what's best for the NDP. And, you know, those things aren't always the same thing. And so these are tough decisions to have, to, sorry, just tough decisions to make. Um, but I imagine that she'll have something to say about it soon. Um, and then, you know, should there be a leadership race, a lot is going to get you know, wound up and people are going to be stepping forward and there'll be a renewed excitement inside the party. Um, and if she chooses to stay on, you're going to see what you have seen from her for, you know, the last 15 years of her political career, where she is extremely principled and extremely dedicated to standing up for what she believes is best for Alberta. Yeah, I mean, I've always said I don't agree with Rachel Notley on everything, uh, or I think she's ideologically misinformed, but uh, I have the utmost so respect diplomatic. for her. I know. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm <laughs> taking this new route. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I have very much, like, a lot of respect for her. Um, I think we joked when we were announcing the podcast on um, Real Talk that, you know, like, at a wedding... Um, Instead of watching the groom, or in this case, you know, the, the governing party, I'm excited to watch, or sorry, the the bride, like the governing party, I'm just going to watch the groom. And and again, like she's she's not acting like she's leaving. She's not acting like she's just found this um, this brand of herself that is so strong. So, I mean, I'm excited to see what this means. Um, I don't have, you know, I have a short list of who I think might run, but like you said, there's no there's no clear direction either way. Yeah. And I think, I mean, whether she decides to stay on or whether she decides um, to step aside, I think what you get from the NDP remains consistent. And Rachel is extremely principled and extremely dedicated. I mean, she suggested, you know, quietly after the 2019 campaign that she might not stay to 2023. And then because she believed so strongly in the work she was doing, she stayed. She stayed to, through the 2023 election campaigning on the things that she thought would make Alberta better. And I think no matter what her decision is here, you will continue to see that from her because that's she she has no other speed. That is her personality. Yeah, she's she's kind of all or nothing. And I think we can probably both uh, <laughs> agree we might have some <laughs> of those characteristics. What, what are you expecting from like this legislative session, right? Like we've had week one, six bills introduced. Lots of them I find are like of no surprise, right? There's lots of campaign commitments, which you would expect to 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 be coming down the line um like how do you think even from i guess the election till now and then during this legislative session danielle smith's doing you know i i think in the interest of just being honest and not you know toting our party's po talking points on this podcast i i will admit that i'm impressed by danielle smith i think that she um came through the election campaign with a lot of people really worried that she was going to say things as premier that were not well thought through that she was going to be um unreasonable in terms of her approach to priorities and I, I don't think she has been completely reasonable i'll just put that out there and we can discuss it as we sort of move through the podcast today but in terms of her demeanor and in terms of her steady hand i think she's she's presented herself really well she started with this during the um leaders debate during the election where you know a lot of people tuned into that debate wondering can danielle smith come across as a credible provincial leader with a steady hand that can guide alberta and we can trust her and to her credit she did that during the the leaders debate and she really showed herself to be credible to be able to look into the camera to make eye contact and talk to alberta about you know what she saw for its future and and to to offer a little humility at the same time mm -hmm. And I think over the course of the last five months, she's done that, at least the opportunities that I've had to see her, um, you know, during Q&A sessions at chamber lunches, those are so hard to do. And her years and years of journalism have definitely paid off. She is calm, cool, and collected, and certainly portrays herself as someone who is a credible leader. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to, we're talking about, you know, she didn't say anything unreasonable. When it comes to, has she done anything unreasonable? I think that's a different story. And I think, you know, choosing to, in your first term, in your first session, uh, focus on things like CPP, which I know we're going to jump into a little bit later, um, that sort of has the opposite effect. You can, you can have a great performance, but if what you're putting forward in terms of government policy um, doesn't match that, people are still going to wonder if you're right for the job. 
Yeah, I mean, I think she's one of my favorite things about her um, in knowing her for a long time. We always joke like there was it had to take the UCP to get us together because we worked against each other um, as two conservative parties in Alberta for quite some time. But one of the things I I love is her willingness to do those dialogues like that's where you truly see uh, Danielle Smith, like not just as premier, but but her who she is in those fireside chats. And if people have the opportunity, you know, a little bit of hesitant about her going and watching um, one of those lunches. Um, it's just it's just her and her natural element and where you see a little bit more raw than you would see from lots of premiers that are always just in front of a, a podium. I think she's yeah, she definitely has stepped up um, on the CPP issue. And I know we're going to get to it a little bit more of like what it means. Um, you know, it, it was something that was raised by your party during the election. Um, trying to claim that we're, we're stealing it, all of those things. I think that narrative, um, you know, fell flat during the election there was a report now the report came back so for her to introduce it when she committed that it was going to be released shortly thereafter i don't think is indicative of of her picking picking that i think that process was already you know in, in the works beforehand um where i do think she's shining right now um is definitely on leveraging you know the the c69 uh decision by the supreme court she's really owning um the bread and butter of of a lot of alberta conservatives which is standing up to ottawa uh the economy continues to thrive and you can give credit to the government or not um but you know being in the in the war room and and knowing how much like the the corporate tax rate really hurts you guys um and how much that you know we're, we're hearing from like you hear from investment about the the environment that alberta operates i think she's really honing in um and to come back to your point she's honing into the things she knows that matter to people and i think that's what's really starting to you know get her in her groove and and have albertans warm up to her a little bit more than they did in may and I think like it's worth talking a little bit about how the parties have set up themselves up for this session, because this is certainly a thread that we've seen from the UCP um, session kicked off this week. It kicked off with a throne speech, which, you know, the, lays out the government's priorities and what they hope to accomplish during the legislative session. And, uh, you know, we can admit freely that for most people, they're not tuning in and watching the legislative session in real time. And I realize there are probably a number of people listening in their cars right now that just said, hey, I watch QP. Um, congratulations, you're a political nerd. But most people <laughs> are not watching QP in real time. They're seeing the clips. They're seeing the um, headlines. They're seeing the news that comes out of it. But this is like truly inside baseball of parties hoping to, hoping to position themselves to make ripples in news elsewhere. Um, the UCP introduced their first throne speech of this mandate, and certainly provincial autonomy was a real thread throughout the speech. Yeah, I mean, and to, to go back just for folks that might not know, um, you know, you say mandate, um, because Danielle Smith, like Premier, did have her first one when she was elected. In the world of politics, we always say it's their mandate. So <laughs> I've lived through a lot of these in the world of conservative <laughs> premiers in Alberta, unfortunately. But um, that there is, you know, those you have someone that comes in as party leader by de facto becomes premier and is not actually elected by the people. So when yeah, this is her her second throw speech, her first as um, elected premier by by Albertans. I think you know it was very much the words and the the writing that I got to do during the campaign and the talking, you know, key messages. Um, it was consistent with, you know, affordability, standing up to Ottawa, making uh, communities safe, public safety, uh, or tough on crime. Um, so there was no, you know, a strong economy. There wasn't really any surprises in the throne speech. And I think that that was very reflective as well with the first six bills that were introduced. The one thing I will say is, Whenever I think of session, and I don't know if it's like from our, our days at the ledge, I actually always think about like it's the one time that politicians and staff um, actually had like I used to look forward to session, not because I love the theatrics of, of the legislature. And I always say this is like, yeah, it's the it's the drama center where you want to sound bite. And it, it's not necessarily the place where the big changes um, you feel the impact as an Albertan. It's where, you know, the bills are passed to be able to to make law. But the consistency, like, do you remember just looking forward to session? Because you were like, oh, I know when I'm going to eat a meal. I know when I'm going to be able to um, 
sleep in my own bed, like all of those types of things that like it's the only time in politics that there's actually regiment. And I'm sure a yeah, lot of these staff with the changes because there's, um, you know, a, a smaller majority government, like they have to be in the house a lot more. So there's not as like, you know, 1 a.m. sittings as much as there was in the past and probably less legislation as a whole than than what we saw under under the Kenny government. So <laughs> I'm like thinking of all my friends that work in politics being like, this is going to be the nicest like session, the most routine, most scheduled and uh yeah, I don't miss it, but uh, I can definitely say that that would be like something that at least I'd look forward to as a staffer. Well, and it was interesting because, yeah, you looked forward to it because on a, on a day outside of session, who knows where you're going to be, who knows who you're going to be with, who knows, like you said, when you're going to eat lunch. Um, but session does bring this incredible routine from Monday to Thursday where you know what time you have to be there, what meetings are going to happen, and you know when you get to go to the bathroom. Um, but I do also clearly, clearly remember counting down the days until session was over because there is such a uh, acute attention on politics at the time, even if it is inside baseball. You know, the media is focused on the issues. They're all focused around the same issues. The politicians are all focused on the same issues. Yes, the staff is not pulled in multiple directions, but neither are the politics. So it, me it makes small fires bigger fires. And that intensity, I think, when it finally comes to an end is like an incredible relief for staffers as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the blackouts. Like if you're in retail, you can't go away at Christmas. You just don't get to travel. I think both of us talked earlier about how we're going to be filming one of these while we're both in different different yeah. uh, countries. So um, again, I, I'm excited to, to see how the next few weeks of the session go. Um, my biggest takeaway from how I think the first week went, it was uh, pretty tame. I want to talk about motion eight, which I think we'll talk about when we get into some of the uh, carbon tax um, exemption stuff. But I think it was pretty like to me, I mean, and maybe I've just lived this too long. It was pretty quiet. It was pretty tame. No big, huge surprises um, other than a little bit of drama during the throne speech. But, uh, you know, I think it was like a pretty standard, standard week. Yeah, I, th I think for the NDP too, it accomplished what an, any opposition party hopes to accomplish in session. Like the government is hoping to pass their legislation and you know live up to the promises that it's made to the electorate and make its supporters happy. The opposition is hoping to make news and to hopefully eat into the credibility of the government. And so for the NDP this week, it released its alternative throne speech uh, late last week, which is a huge lift for an opposition party. And the NDP has done this for a number of years. And I think they're hoping to talk about CPP and they're hoping to talk about protecting healthcare in Alberta. And both of those issues have been in the news and there's been discourse online. And so that is a win for an opposition party. Pick two issues that you feel the government's credibility is failing on and make the platform bigger, make the conversation bigger, have more people paying attention. They've certainly done that this week to the best of an opposition party's ability. Well, maybe that's a good place to to pivot to the subject that everyone talks about all the time, um, which is the CPP or slash APP. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, let, let's jump right in. Like, is there, from my standpoint, um, and I'll come out and say, like, I don't know exactly where I sit. I see this as the Alberta Pension Plan is an opportunity for Albertans to get more, potentially get more money back in their pockets. And if we can explore ways of doing that, I'm all for it. Like have at or explore all those things. I, there was lots of stuff that came out of the Fair Deal panel um, a few years ago that I was like, yeah, let's explore it, right? I don't think that that means that there's a pre-conceived um, outcome, but I do, I do think that there's a lot of like hiccups that have happened so far on communicating what the APP would look like. Um, Ottawa has been no friend in, in, you know, delivering numbers, explaining what the, the contrast to what the United Conservative Party or the government is saying about the opportunity of Alberta pension plan. Um, you know, I think that there was a lot more that could have been explained. Uh, I've read the report. I've, you know, participated in the survey. I've done, you know, all the things that I, I 
I think that someone should, that wants to educate themselves should do. And I'm still like left with a bunch of questions. So I think that there's a lot of Albertans. I'm not going to let the UCP off the hook. I think it's a great idea and I love that we're exploring it. And I do believe that it should be explored to full course. Um, you know, I'm going to sound like my father, but when a task is first begun, never leave it till it's done and, uh, getting wow. out. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's a shout out to my dad. <laughs> um, but like, do the consultation, go through the process, um, and then see, right. I, I know that there's been initial, you know, horrible pushback from some people. There's been reception from others. Um, I don't think you just come up with a definitive answer, but there is, I'm not going to let them off the hook and say that they've knocked this out of the park on how they delivered it. Well, and I think like the point I want to focus on for something that you just said is that you don't think there's a preconceived outcome here, but the government is not running a public consultation on CPP. It's running a propaganda campaign on CPP with numbers that have not been proven, with a survey that doesn't allow Albertans to say they don't want to leave CPP, dropping you know flyers in mailboxes with unproven data and filling the airwaves with why leaving CPP is a good idea. Like to me, that is the government pushing an agenda. That is a preconceived outcome. That is where the government intends to land. And if you're truly exploring this issue, that's not what the conversation sounds like. The opportunity to, in the survey for people to say, I don't want to leave CPP and these are my reasons should have been job number one. Like, let's just see where Albertans stand. And, and I, do, I don't disagree with um, having that exact question, right? I think that that would be, would be a fair place. Um, I mean, the survey is not necessarily the consultations. There are a, like a load of places you can go to learn them in more information. Like that's kind of a, a initial litmus test of like, if you had some information you want to learn more, okay, let's continue. It's, it's part of the process. Um, and so then they move on to, you know, those in-person con consultations, which again, I think they should explore. Um, today, depending when this airs, uh, the federal ministers are all meeting about this with uh, Minister Freeland um, to talk about CPP and what that means. I don't think that the liberal government is doing, like the federal liberal government is doing a service here. If, if what you said around false stats are inaccurate, then like give the numbers, right? The liberal party of Canada is not helping explain any more about the benefits of CPP. And here is a group that's gone out and found those numbers and the potential prospect um, and are starting to talk about what the opportunity is. But I am going to say that I do think if you're going to go to a referendum, you've got to have all the opportunities and the challenges laid out. But the survey is not the, the referendum, nor is it the consultation. But here's what I don't get, because I find it very, very hard to make the case that this is a good idea. And I think for anyone who has seen any public opinion polling on this or just talk to your friends and neighbors, the majority of Albertans are not supportive of it. So why, as a new government, in your first term of a renewed mandate, would you, like, and I know you're saying, you know, some of this started before, but certainly with a multi-million dollar ad campaign, Daniel Smith and the UCP have really, really leaned into leaving CPP hard. And I just don't understand why. So I would take it back first to like why this all started. And for those that don't you know, know, it was part of a recommendation through the Fair Deal panel that was commissioned to look at how does Alberta get their fair deal in um, Confederation that comes down to like equalization, a bunch of other places um, where where Alberta is, you know, I always say we're like one of the all star players that, um, you know, is is asked to step in when we're 20 points behind and you're expected to win the game. Um, and and it, there's a lot of responsibility that falls to us uh, as a contributor. We're happy to do it, but then like we've been hurting and we don't really get the same benefit as others. So there's a lot of Albertans that would echo that sentiment. So the whole purpose of the Fair Deal was like to find areas in which jurisdictionally or through um, legislative changes, the uh, we could look at getting more money back in Alberta's pockets and in quotations less to Ottawa. Um, there is a huge divide um, of like how or sentiment towards how people and Albertans from the ones I talk to, I'm not going to reference a poll because that's more just like me talking to folks and seeing what people care about is is the the combativeness with Ottawa. And I think that that's where a lot of this started is just wanting to be treated equally. And 
And so this is one way to explore. Again, it was a recommendation. Didn't need to be explored, but it was. We had a report come back that then got sent back given COVID, came back again and had some, rec- you know, had this this layout that is is available on a website um, for, for everyone that wants to go. Saying like, when, it, when equally the NDP had been like, they're stealing your pensions, which I think is like a little bit extreme um, on the other side, and I'm sure spending some money on that, uh, is also misleading. So, I mean, I'd like your opinion on on what the strategy is with the stealing your your pension from from the opposition party. I think there's a lot of public sentiment, and I think the UCP knows this, that people feel like they they need to protect what they have built for themselves over the course of their careers for retirement. And the NDP has picked up on that sentiment, and that's why you hear that really hot rhetoric about the government stealing your pension. Um, because they're sort of tapping into how fe- how emotional people feel about protecting the nest egg or the retirement security that they've built for their entire careers. They know what's there and they don't want it messed with. And the reason that I say that I think the government, the UCP, understands this sentiment is because the UCP introduced some really interesting legislation this week. The Alberta Protection Pension Protection Act um, that basically lays out four criteria that would have to be met before... Alberta could leave CPP and start the APP. And why I think that's interesting is that the criteria that are laid out do not need to be legislated. Like normally these are things that people feel their government or they trust their government, especially a brand new government to do. They trust that their government is not going to irrevocably harm their retirement security. They trust that the government is not going to act outside of its mandate. And they trust that the government's going to act in the best interest of the population And in this case, the UCP knows that Albertans don't feel that way. They have introduced an act to literally protect Alberta from its own government to say, don't worry, we can't do anything to hurt your retirement security until we've met these criteria. And I think that legislation in itself is really telling. And so I I would take something different was that the commitment of a referendum and the process in which would come to to reality and fruition should that happen um, is the reassurance of what the government has said is what the government's going to do I mean we're the nerds that you know work in the world of reading policy and and what that means but it's subject to interpretation I want to come back because you said it's very interesting and I know that like I want to just like dig into what do you what do you mean by that on the legislation? Yeah. You just said it's like interesting how they do it. And I just, yeah, I just want to like I, get some clarification. The legislation there. is interesting to me. Like I don't, I mean, of course, everybody understands that sometimes governments pass legislation not because they are legally necessary, but because it's sort of a ceremonial thing. It's an opportunity to talk about what you really want to talk about. But for me, this, I wonder what happened in the back rooms to say we need this piece of legislation. And I wonder if it's, you know, Albertans are worried that the government is going to do something, you know, without all the data or something that's not in the best interests of Albertans because they can make political gains. And so they've introduced this legislation that I don't think sends a really strong political message that the government needs to protect Alberta from action the government of Alberta might take. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, now I'm going to use interesting. Um, like it's an interesting approach you're taking because again, like where I come from reading this was like we were, you guys came at us hard um, during the campaign saying that that was the case. They're going to steal your pension. Um, and so I can understand why they would introduce something to reaffirm what they said, which is here's the process in which it, it may not need to be legislated, but it might be symbolic to those that might be interested in exploring an APP, but are also like, you know, I, I want to make sure that there's a process in place. And by legislating something that actually might give them the the calmness or reassurance that they're looking for. Um, I do want to come back, though, on like if you think it's fair, um, the approach that the NDP is taking. Like, do you think that it's kind of manipulating people in any way to say they're stealing your pensions? Because to me, when I hear that, I'm like, lots of people get them through their employer. Lots of people, like, you, not everyone qualifies for CPP. There's lots of professions that can't contribute. Um, and, and you have to pay into CPP. And I don't know the, the percentage of the population, but there, then there's OAS, like your old age security that everyone is entitled to. Like, to me, it's like kind of a fear mongering tactic. And I just want to get your rationale of like the, the inside strategy to that. 
Well, listen, I think we both know politics is not fair. And so <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, do I think that the NDP's position or rhetoric on any of these issues is completely fair? No, but that's not the game that we're playing. Um, I think that the rhetoric around CPP, although may be a little hotter than what you hear in the public, echoes the public sentiment. And that is the theater of politics, right? You take what you hear from the population and you torque it enough so that people continue to hear it. And I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's always completely accurate. Like I don't think that necessarily everyone out there thinks, you know, I'm at risk of having my pension stolen. Um, but I do think that the emotional attachment to our pensions and the worry about the pensions and the implications of leaving CPP are very, very real. And if you want that discussion to continue, and if you want to get the clips in the newspapers and on social media, you have to use hot language. Yeah, I guess we both played this game, so <laughs> we know that there's like buzzwords included. Um, but and on that, so... I think that there's uh, what we can agree. I always like to try and find our little middle ground. Our agree, <laughs> where we agree is that like there, there's no clear direction on on where the CPP APP is, um, and that we're heading into a place where like I think a lot of tellingness, um, and that the minister Minister Horner will get some feedback from his colleagues because there is, to your point, there is implication beyond our own borders of what leaving the CPP would look like, and that's one of the questions I would love to better understand. Um, I don't think the United Conservative Party is knock this one out of the park, but there's probably going to be a few more episodes where we're going to talk about what's happening with uh, the CPP. So um, I'm going to pivot to us to a lovely conversation, which I think the UCP is owning right now, <laughs> which is uh, the the carbon tax exemption. Um, we're seeing a lot of conversation across, uh, you know, from coast to coast on the carbon tax uh, exemption, and especially because of the favoritism that we're seeing from the federal government on an exemption only for um, oil heating, uh, home heating, which uh, you're seeing from Atlantic Canada. One of the ministers came out saying, well, if the prairies want this, they need to elect uh, more liberals out there. If I was uh, uh, George Shahal or Randy Boissonneau, I would be like, oh, crap. Like, what does this ha do for my reelection strategy? Um, oddly, kind of doubling down on that, which uh, I think will be uh, interesting when we uh, head into the next election. But um, what, what's your hot take on it? I mean, I think that the, the UCP, this is their bread and butter. Uh, they're leaning into this. They're aligned with, you know, uh, Saskatchewan, um, including the Saskatchewan NDP, on asking for fairness uh, from the federal government and giving this um, to everyone. But your your party was the the like kind of the the trailblazers of carbon tax. So yeah. yeah, and who knew they would also be the trailblazers to uh, stand up and speak out against this regional favoritism. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like when we talk about not hitting it out of the park this week, I think that could also be applied to this announcement of the exemption of home heating oil from the carbon tax in Atlantic Canada. Um, it sparked a huge amount of backlash across Canada from, you know, uh, premiers and opposition parties who felt this was regional favoritism, who felt it was deeply unfair. And one of those people who spoke up was Rachel Notley. And I mean, this is a, as you say, very tough line for the NDP to walk because the NDP has been vocal uh, advocates for action on climate change, including uh, policy. And I'm sure no one has forgotten um, the party that brought in the carbon tax in Alberta initially. So um, to now come out and say, we believe that home heating in Alberta should also be exempt is a tough thing to do. But two things I think have really changed since the NDP initially announced a carbon tax in Alberta for, to where we are today. One is that families are facing an, an affordability crisis that we have not seen in the last decade. And we're looking for relief. Families are looking for relief. Governments are looking for opportunities to give relief wherever they can find it. And and this this issue of the federal government playing uh, regional favoritism, of course, anybody, I mean, Rachel Notley, po politics aside, has always said, above all, I will stand up for Alberta. And so because this has been a national strategy that we, you know, we were all in this together, um, she's basically saying, like, listen, I support climate policy, but I support cross-Canada climate policy. And in this case, if we're going to exempt home heating oil, let's exempt the other fuels that Canadians are using to heat their homes. Is it a win? No. I would not call this a win, 
but it puts the Alberta NDP on the right side of rational on this issue. And I and I completely agree with you. It is an absolute gift to conservatives across the country. Okay, well, I feel like we could do this all day, mm-hmm. but uh, we're coming up on, you know, making it to the end of the podcast here and look forward to hearing about how the AGM went and rehashing any wild headlines that come out of it um, on next week's show. See you next week. So that's it for today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the first episode of The Discourse. You can find us on social media, on X and on Instagram. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your ideas, your comments, your segment suggestions. And we hope that you'll tune in next week. The Discourse is hosted by Cheryl Oates and Erica Baroudis. Follow on Instagram at The Discourse Pod. Subscribe to The Discourse on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts.